soon to hold And it's too late to cry Watched in stunned silence As my time goes by How many of you have ever taken a long trip? Maybe a, a cross-country trip by car, and you think of all the things that you have to do. All the preparation for food, you have to have water. You'll have, way back a generation ago, we'd have these things called maps. Have any of you not heard of maps? Maybe you heard of MapQuest, but we actually used to have a physical map and we would turn it this way and that way. Someone would be the navigator in the front seat of the car. They'd figure out, of course, now you can go around the world with GPS, but we'd have all those things. And because we're driving, for us, a family of four, two kids, we would have games. So maybe we would play the, the license plate game. Any of you ever played the license plate game? How many of you can find license plates from every state? And you might get bonus points if you get Hawaii. So we'd have, we'd have license plate game. Maybe you have the color game. Who can find something with the most colors? Or we like the alphabet game. How many of you can find something that starts with A. And before you can get to C, you have to find a, a, a sign or a word that starts with B. All of these games we would play to keep us occupied on our trip. And as I look back at Exodus chapter 12 and 13, I think about what Moses and God did to get a group of people, the Bible says 600,000 people going from a place in Egypt to some place called the Promised Land. Now, 600,000 people, and it says in, in Exodus 12, 37, there were also children. And verse 38 of Exodus 12 says that another group went with them, something called the mixed multitude. And, you know, you think about what, what exactly is a mixed multitude? A mixed multitude in Egypt at that time would have been, of course, Egyptians, because they, they revered, many of them revered Moses because he had done things they had never seen before. And they had seen his miracles. And please consider in verses 29 and 30 of Exodus 12, every household that wasn't under the protection of God had had a tragedy. Every one of them had experienced a death just days before. So Moses had this group of individuals going along with them. There were also slaves going along with them. Everyone was joining this, I hate to use the word caravan because of what we have going on in, in our political climate today, but this, this group of individuals were going. So some commentators said that there were up to two million people that Moses was leading. And Oh, also, I forgot. They also had stuff. You have stuff. So they had, the Bible said they had flocks and herds. Now, I've seen pictures of, of artists depicting people going through the Red Sea, right? You've seen those too. Don't usually see cows and sheep and goats going through the Red Sea as an artist depicts it. But, but Moses, as he writes it, he says all of these things. And of course, people are carrying things because the Bible also mentions that the Israelites plundered or spoiled Egypt. So they had all this stuff. And you think that, wow, that's a lot of, a lot of stuff they were going on this trip. You ever wonder how far the promised land was? You ever, ever think about that? So, of course, I, I wondered. And I, and I looked it up, and I, I, I thought, you know, maybe 
it was the distance between um, here and, oh, I don't know, the Midwest, maybe here to Chicago, maybe here to Texas, but it was from here to San Jose and then back up nine miles. That's as far away as the promised land was, about 125 miles. All those millions of people thinking about food, thinking about water, thinking about caring for their crops, have to have games for the kids and some of us adults, all of these things. And you can imagine that if they are going to something called the promised land, it didn't go so smoothly. But you would think, how long would it take for you? Well, how, how many of you, I should back up a little bit. Last generation, we had something in the church called Pathfinders. Any of you hear of a group called Pathfinders? Oh, a lot of hands on any of you, or any of you ever Pathfinders? In Pathfinders, we learn how to tie knots, and we learn, we, you get these badges. It was amazing. You'd have guides, you'd have master guides, you'd learn how to do all kinds of great things, activities for kids, and you would imagine that our Pathfinder leaders taking us to a place where we hadn't been. So sometimes we would go out and we'd spend the night under the stars, all kinds of amazing things that our Pathfinder leaders would, would have for us. Moses was a Pathfinder leader. And he had to deal with all kinds of things because people often forgot there was one other person that was going with them the entire trip. And we see from Ex in Exodus 13, verses 21 and 22, this is very important. It says, the, I'm reading from the New King James Version, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Can you imagine if you were going someplace and every time you looked up, you saw God's presence? Wouldn't that make you feel good? Would you have worries? No, you would. I'd hope not. But yet we have this group of people going from this church to San Jose and then backing up nine miles. And what could possibly have kept them out, an entire generation, out of the promised land? Ashley read a verse, Luke 17, 1 and 2. It's very interesting because let's, let's go to that. I'm sorry, was, um, I'm not sure if I said Luke 17, 1 and 2. And this is Jesus talking. Then he said to his disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. So we look at our key word for this passage is offenses. And what is an offense? Depending on the version of the Bible that you use, you might find a different term. Mine uses a term called stumbling blocks. Have you ever heard of a stumbling block? Sometimes we have stumbling blocks in life that keep us from where we want to go, where we need to go. And this, this word offenses or stumbling blocks comes from a Greek word. Don't mean to get all, all, um, all extra with you, but um, the word is scandalon, scandalon. And that's a very interesting word because we have an English word that comes from that, and that's the word scandal. So Jesus is saying it's impossible that no scandals are going to happen. But you better not be the one through whom scandals occur. So we'll come back to that in a second. 
the Israelites, as they were going to the promised land, and another way of saying that, they were going to a land that was promised to them, just as you and I are going to a land that is promised to us. Is it possible that a stumbling block could keep us out? So if you're interested, and this is a, a homework assignment, if you like. I know you come to church looking for homework assignments. A homework assignment, if you like, would be to look up the different complaints that the Israelites had as they were going to the promised land and compare them to kind of the kind of complaints that we might have. So the very first one, they're not hardly out of Egypt in Exodus 14. They are marching toward something called the promised land. They turn around, and who do they see but the Egyptian army? And they complain to Moses, saying, well, hang on a second. You brought us out of Egypt to get killed right here. Do you ever complain? Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Could fear, which is what they're dealing with here, right? You turn around, you see something, you're flying down the freeway, you're doing well. So let's, let's, let's make this in, in today's terms. How many, of you, how many of you drive on the freeway to work? Okay, so you're driving down the freeway, you're doing real well, things are going fine, then suddenly there's a traffic jam. How many of you ever been, a, been in a traffic jam? You're riding to work by yourself. And as you are stuck, and, because, and you are so frustrated, because you have to be there at a certain time and you're going to be late. Now, it just so happens, normally you travel in the fast lane. And there happens to be a lane over one with an interesting figure in it called a diamond, a diamond lane. And that lane happens to be empty. And you think, you know what? If I pop into this lane for just a few minutes, even though I'm riding by myself, and Normally, I wouldn't. If I pop into this lane for just a few minutes, and then I'll move back over, traffic, I will get ahead of the traffic, everything will be fine. So you pop over, and guess what? The clouds part, the sun comes out, your favorite song comes on by the old-time religion singers. <laughs> And you are just, you are knowing that you are going to make it on time until, yeah, when a California's finest that you didn't see on a motorcycle pulls up behind you. That, if you haven't experienced fear, that's called fear. <laughs> so you have, the Israelites saw the Egyptian army, it was like, I, I, and I, sorry, I don't want to compare it. To, an, an army, a group of people coming to get them. Fear. And they said, Moses, we have you to blame for this. Might fear be a stumbling block that keeps you out of the kingdom? So, homework assignment. I would like you to consider the things that are stumbling blocks in your life. And start with fear. What fears do you have? If you remember that you have God's presence, because right there was the pillar of fire, right there was the pillar of cloud that was God's presence right there. They could just turn and look and they could see a vision of God, but yet they let whatever was going on in their life be a bigger priority and cause fear. So that's the first fear. And that is talking about our, our Pathfinder days. And those of you, so how many of you, when you were Pathfinders, went camping? Anybody go camping? And you, do you remember the first time you went camping? It was cold out, and you're in a tent, and it's not comfortable. You're in a sleeping bag, and you're looking at your, at your guide or master guide thinking, this is supposed to be fun. There are mosquitoes buzzing around. We have food. There aren't sh the showers are way down there. And oh, it's only cold water. You have got to be kidding me. I, I had to sign up to do this. So all of this is what the Israelites were dealing with. Moses, you brought us out. Uh, notice, 
Moses, because they, they are complaining at Moses to Moses, Moses, you brought us out for this. So their first stumbling block was fear. Fear in themselves and mistrust or a lack of trust in God. Please again remember, they had just observed, experienced 10 miracles. And look at the miracles in your life that God has gifted you with. And as we look at all the miracles, God would say to you and to me, how can you possibly distrust me? How could you possibly have fear when I have done all of this? You have seen my hand. You know what I've done. There is no reason to doubt. And yet, that's the enemy's greatest tool, is doubt, fear. So, they, so God, of course, works it out, and they continue moving along until just two chapters later. So you and your family driving along, and you know, if you have kids, at some point, you're going to hear words like this. Daddy, Mommy, I'm hungry. It's like, uh-huh, we made you sandwiches. <laughs> I don't want sandwiches. And because, because the complaints are so great, we do things that we'd never do at any other time. McDonald's. Right? If I were to say we're going to have a church potluck, we went in there and I gave you McDonald's, how would you feel? Yeah, I was like, oh, really? That's the best you could do. And so you are, you are thinking, wow, you know, I remember back at home, we had leeks and onions and, and veggie links and, and all of our favorite veggie food. But now, because the kids are complaining, all I want them to do is be quiet. How many times has something called appetite controlled your behaviors? And that is another stumbling block. So I have a friend, not a member of this church, that he does not read the sides of boxes when he buys food because he said this is his belief you can decide if you agree with it or not he believes that if he does not read the ingredients in something God will not hold him accountable <laughs> yes that's how he believes and he told me this with a straight face and and so that's the next stumbling block is, as we just mentioned, the mixed multitude. So we have this group of Israelites, and they have a strong spiritual religious belief in God that they have been taught all of their lives. And then you have this other group of individuals. Those were the Egyptians who just came along because Moses was greater than Pharaoh. That's obvious. And you had other individuals from other countries who just happened to be there. And the Israelites are hearing the mixed multitude complain about the leeks and the onions and the fish and the veggie meat and the tofurkey. And they're thinking, you know, well, uh, they never gave any of that to us to eat. But here, that, that sounds pretty good. And so when you're there and you're... Your, the person next to you at work says, you know, hey, you, you, you've never had a burger? And, and you, it smells good. You kind of peek over, and it does look like the commercial. And you look at your salad sandwich, and you think, you know, yeah. And they said, I got one just for you, right? Have you ever been to a potluck, and, or something just 
before the holidays and they don't know at work that you're a vegetarian or you're vegan and they say, I made this just for you. <laughs> and you know that gravy is not from ABC. <laughs> what are you going to do, right? So the school where I went to, the college where I went to, this will cause some of you to shudder. I went to La Sierra. The religion instructor, a very, a very popular religion instructor, said he was at a situation once where he had gone to someone's house. He was doing Bible studies with them, but he hadn't yet gotten to food. And this family didn't have a lot of money. But they appreciated what he had done so much that they made a great, wonderful, smelling pig for him. And he, had the, he, had, he said he had a decision to make. Is he going to eat the pig from a group of individuals, a family who he had been studying the Bible with? He was still ministering to them. They didn't have much money. He said, I could either eat the pig or and he had never had pig before in his life, he could either eat the pig and possibly continue going on to the next study that we're going to have is on food. Or he could offend them in his eyes. This is, these are his words. I'm repeating his words. These are not my words. Or he could offend them by not eating what they had prepared for him. What would you do? Yeah, see, just here, just here, there are a lot, of, a lot of considerations. And that is the mixed multitude making decisions, you making decisions based on what others are doing, have done, what is important, what their values are. Might that be a stumbling block that impedes your ability to have a relationship with God that will ultimately get you into his kingdom. So in, in, uh, in Matthew 18 and in Luke 17, Ashley read something really interesting. And she said that Jesus says that it will be better for you to have a rock tied around your neck and pitched into the Pacific Ocean than to offend one of God's little ones. How many of you, and, and by the way, this is the only reference where we might say, Jesus says it's better for you to commit suicide than to mess up. Have you ever considered that? It would be better for you to tie a rock around your neck, throw yourself into the ocean, you're probably not going to survive that. It would be better for you to commit suicide in God's eyes than to offend one of his little ones. Can you imagine? Please read it. Luke 17, Matthew 18. That's how important God's little ones are to him. So let's consider this for just a second. Because Jesus says, um, it's impossible that no offenses, stumbling blocks, scandals will come, but don't you be the one. So if you think that I am going to do something that is going to be a stumbling block for someone else, think of how seriously Jesus takes it. Because later in Matthew 18, Jesus says, because, you know, the kids have an angel, and that angel sees God's face on a regular basis. And I'm sure it's not just seeing his face like, like Facebook or like, like their, their video conferencing. No, they're right there. And if they see the face of the Father on a regular basis, what do you think they're seeing the face of the Father about? How are... How are you raising the kids that I've given you? How are you? And, and so when we say little ones, 
we're going to take a quick segue, because it's not just kids, it's also new believers, young in the faith. What are we doing to ensure that our young spiritually, our young age-wise, don't have stumbling blocks? And you, as you know, Jesus says, either you're for me or what? There's, there's, no, there's no spiritual Switzerland. There's no neutral ground where you can do your own thing. You're either 100% for and with God or you're against him. So please consider. And so I meant to mention at the beginning, this sermon is for me. I'm sitting there on the front row and I'm listening. I'm thinking about what are the stumbling blocks that I have in my life? Now, growing up, I grew up a very interesting time where, where music, I love music. I love all kinds, well, I don't like country music, but other than that, I love all kinds, all kinds of other kinds of music. And music would be a stumbling block for me because I would never listen to the lyrics. How many of you like music, but don't bother with the lyrics? If you were to hear the lyrics, it may cause you to shudder. For some people, TV is a stumbling block. For some people, the phone is a stumbling block. And everyone has a unique set of stumbling blocks that Satan is tossing in front of you. So my stumbling block isn't necessarily yours, but Satan has a stumbling block for you that he wants to ensure keeps you out of the kingdom. And God has said, I will help you remove them. I'm not going to remove them from you because you need to know who is the Lord of your life. And that's your choice. So let's let's have a word of prayer and consider what could possibly be worth missing the kingdom over. Dear Lord, we thank you for this message, certainly one that I need. I look at my life, stumbling blocks, clutter, all the stuff that I have, and I ask for your forgiveness, Lord, for allowing things to get in the way of our relationship. And I pray, Lord, that you will help me to be more reflective of what I do, how I do it, and may I just glorify you. And I pray the same for each person and the audience so that we may all may all be ready to see you when you return in Jesus name amen years are taken from my life in trade for a moment of sin I'll be glad when When my life begins again